Good morning. What a joy to be together. We had, um, I think, 80, 80 people do the budget classes on uh, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday night, which is fantastic. Pastor David Washington was there to lead us, and uh, I'm so pleased that 80 of you went to that to help you. So our financial fitness strategy has been certainly to raise the finances for our uh, facilities upgrade over the next uh, three years. But more than that, it's been to help you better manage your life. And you better manage your life when you enter into a savings program and a debt reduction strategy and ensure that you live within your means. And I know so many people that uh, pay the banks so much money they've got hardly any to live on and, uh, and certainly their giving to God and giving to the poor and needy is minimal. So the more freedom you have, the more fit you become financially, then the more you're able to be generous and to look after yourselves and as well as uh, in God's kingdom. And we had uh, uh, a couple of fantastic testimonies. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had um, Brenda Giles share in her own quiet way, but so powerful of how from a little girl she was trained in how to, to handle her finances from her dad. And she's been a magnificent uh, uh, member here and also, you know, just flies beneath the radar. Hardly anyone knows her in that sense. She's not an upfront person, but by golly, she has helped expand the kingdom of God just through her, her stewardship, her generosity and supporting her big brother, Tim, as he was a missionary. So she was fantastic. And then, of course, uh, Adrian Cottrell, last Sunday, he introduced a new term to us. It's called G-R-S, Greed Reduction Strategy. I've never heard that before. And he said every time he tithes, he goes, you can't be greedy and tithe at the same time. So, so he said God has designed that as we give to him weekly into his storehouse, where we give our 10% to him, which is a significant amount, it challenges us regarding, am I greedy? How, am I becoming more selfless or, or am I becoming more selfish? Uh, for me, the greed reduction strategy hits me when I go to developing countries. And you go, I just came back to the Solomon Islands a few weeks ago, and uh, an island, island nation of hundreds of islands, one million people, they don't even have one dialysis machine. So you get diabetes, kidney disease, and you will just die. Here in Australia, what a, what a blessed country we have. And, uh, uh, and so, but you realize when you go to these places, I come back and say, God, help me to be less greedy, less selfish, and to be more generous, more thankful for the country that we have. And Australia is a blessed country. You go, to, you go to some countries, they've got no taxpayers' money for mental health or, or basic health and hospitals and education. Here, be thankful. We've got an education system. We've got a health system. We've got care and support. And so I'm proud of our country that we can put in whatever it is, you know, 25, 30% of our taxpayers' dollar to our federal and state governments, and that covers the needs of the poor and the needy. You go to these countries, and it's just terrible. It, it, you, you actually have to shut yourself off a little bit, otherwise you get so upset. And uh, I've just come back from Alice Springs over the past, uh, I went there for 24 hours on Wednesday night to share with the leadership group. We've just bought this property, $550,000, uh, 50,000 deposit, they had already had the money for that, and looking at how they're going to raise the finance for that. But Alice Springs, most of our ministry is to precious indigenous people and a large percentage are on dialysis machines in Alice Springs. And we care for them, share with them, lead them to Christ, pray, and, and at times involved in, in uh, burials for, for God's glory. And so, um, you know, our, our church in Alice is doing a fantastic job, but caring for people that are sick. And, uh, but it's your taxpayer's dollar that goes to actually keep them alive. So be thankful for the country we have. For all of our problems, we've got a great a great country, a great government, both federal and state. Really, we really do, when you have to travel overseas. You know, we get nasty and critical about PMs and premiers, but I tell you what, 
They are saints compared to some of these dodgy characters overseas, I can tell you. So, um, so we are fabulously wealthy as a country. We, we give uh, enormously. And I think as a church, our stewardship is, is one that uh, is so important not to forget God. Give him, give him the 10% he, he, he needs and deserves for his kingdom to expand through his church, our missions giving overseas, and of course, uh, every few years, our facilities development. Now we have all the kids with us today, and uh, I want to share a little story that is relevant for all the kids. So even the little kids, the real little ones, listen to me about this, and your mum and dad can tell you the story found in all four gospels about a little boy, we don't know how old he was, might have been 8, 10, 12, we don't know. But this little boy sowed his very best on a very special day. And my thoughts today are, are that we need to give Jesus our very best. This little kid, his mum let him go out for the day and she gave him a basket with some bread and some fish and said, son, this is for your lunch. Don't forget to eat and then come back at night. So he put the, the thing on his bike and did they have bikes in those days? <laughs> yeah, let's say he walked or, or, or booked a chariot or a Uber chariot or something like that. And he goes and he ends up at a place where Jesus was preaching and teaching 5,000 men. And it was a whole day teaching and and he could see that they became really hungry and there was no food. So he said to his disciples, he says, guys, you see the needs? They're hungry. And they're looking and saying, yeah. And, then, and he said to them, guys, you feed them. He says, you feed them. He gave them a word. He says, they're hungry, you feed them. Well, Philip says, Jesus, where the heck are we going to find the money to feed them? It's going to take eight months' salary, the amount of money that's needed to feed these big hungry men. But Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, he thought he came up with a solution. But he was full of doubt as well. So Philip goes, man, we haven't got enough money. But Jesus gave the word. He gave a word and said, I want these men fed and you guys feed them. Nothing is impossible with Jesus when he gives his word. When he speaks to you, when he speaks, whether you're the youngest kid or the oldest person, when you sense Jesus speaking to you directly through the Holy Spirit or through his word, that word will come to pass if you believe it, if you receive it and act upon it. Anyway, so, so Andrew comes along and I want to put the verse up here. What Andrew says. So Andrew finds this little kid. He finds this little boy, if we can put that up please guys, and he says the following, here is a boy and he has five small barley loaves and two small fish. But notice what he also adds, his fear, his unbelief, his anxiety comes up and he says, but how far will they go among so many? How far? Or the New King James Version says, what are they among so many? Like he's thinking, almost nothing. This almost nothing. How the heck? But you know what? In spite of his fears, in spite of his thinking it through rationally, it doesn't make sense. A little basket with what? Five small barley loaves and two small fish. Notice that they said they're small, really small. So they're looking and saying, what are these among so many? But... Something within him said, well, look, this is, this is all that we've got. And, uh, and Jesus, do you know what he did? He took it and he gave thanks. This is interesting. What an attitude. Jesus believed that he could do the impossible. And so he took the loaves and he didn't go, oh, Father, there's only five little, oh, there's not much here. You better come through for me. Otherwise, I'm going to look like a big idiot. Like, whoa, he just said, thank you. God, thank you. And, and in Matthew and, and Mark's gospel, I had a chance to read them this week. He broke the bread and he prayed and he gave thanks to God with joy because he, he believed that God could do the impossible. And so, so this, 
that, that, that he could feed thousands with this. He can do anything. And I tell you, the hero in this story is actually not Jesus. It's certainly not the 12 disciples. Do you know who the hero is? A little boy the size of some of you kids here. Because that little kid, when Andrew approached him, he could have said, no, that's for me. My mum has given it to me. You ain't having it. He could have said no. But this little kid somehow got caught up, whether he heard Jesus saying, you've got to feed them, they're hungry. And whether he, he, some, some, a spirit of faith grabbed his heart and he gave his almost nothing to Jesus. And, and, and when Jesus then took the loaves and he broke them and he gave thanks, it's like when something is given to God, has something in it far more than when it's not given to God. So before it was given to Jesus, before that little kid stepped out and gave his almost nothing, okay, it's just a natural thing. But then when it's given to God, something happens to it. When you give something to God with genuine, a heart of worship, a heart of thanks, a heart of obedience, a heart of faith, a law comes into it, a blessing comes into it. The power of God comes upon it. And what seems like almost nothing can be feed multitudes. This church started with 15 teenagers, though Pastor Philip says there were 19, but we don't know what the historical record is. But say there were 19 teenagers and a couple of oldies who were probably 40 plus, like Johnny Van, I think, was 41 or something like that, and he was the old man of the group. It started in a shed in the back of somebody's house. And even the great Leo Harris who was the founder of our CRC movement, a man of faith and vision, when they asked him about it, Pastor Ray and others went and spoke to him. Even he scratched his head and goes, hmm, what are these among so many? It seemed like a motley crew, young people. <laughs> and so Leo goes, well, yeah, if you really sense God is calling you to start a church, because maybe you should stay connected to the Sturt Street Mother Church. And just, he's thinking... I need to protect them, I need to cover them. And, and, he, and he let them go because even he thought, it's just, there's just a handful of these kids. 42 years later, this is the largest church of our denominational family. And when you combine what we've, we've commenced and started, the number of people now is probably 3,000 plus people that are part of the churches that we actually directly started since 1990. What are, what are these among so many kids? We started with just teenagers and look what's, what's happened now. These facilities, land and buildings, probably in, if we had to replace them, probably $25 million conservatively. And when these kids got married in the 19, uh, late 1970s, early 1980s, Kathy and I joined in 1978. It's our 41st year. We started producing babies. We had four under five years. That's what we did in those days. You do four or five kids under, under, in the first few years. I don't know what's happened today. They just want to do one or two and that's it. Go for four. Go for five. Anyway, so again, when you have producing children, you don't have a lot of money. You've got a mortgage on the house. You've got to raise the kids. Like Kath and I now are really wealthy that our kids are off our hands and, and you know, we're debt free regarding uh, everything else except some of the assets that we have. And, and, but in that day, it's like, wow, we don't have a lot of money, but God spoke to us to buy a house like we've done in Alice Springs to centralize all our midweek activities like prayer meetings, offices, kids meetings. And we bought a house on the corner of Tapless Hill Road and Charlesville Avenue or Charlesville Drive. And they've knocked it down now and put two houses there. You can see it actually where the big fallow paddock is before you get to West Beach Road. And so we bought that and we had debt, significant debt. But we, we worked out our sums and we did it. And so when we did it, we thought, let's just... And then when the council found out, they said, what are you guys doing? So, well, we bought this house, going to build an office, we're going to do an office there. They said, you can't do that because this is residential zone. You've got to live in it. Well, I didn't want to live in it. And Kathy was pregnant with, with uh, uh, Steph. And so 
we ended up having to live in half of it. We had our own place. <laughs> we had to live in half of it, and the other half was used as an office. We didn't know what we were doing. We just said, let's just buy this land, buy this property, and centralise everything. We bought it for what it was and didn't do it the right way. We learnt the lesson. You don't do that ever again. But then this land became available in 1982. When we sold that house, the prices had gone up so much, we paid it off debt-free and had, I don't know, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000, something like that, maybe less than that, as a deposit for this land. We had almost nothing. We just had a debt. But you sow your best, and out of it, you just don't know, it multiplied. That house multiplied in worth and value, and we are able to buy this, this land through that. Never underestimate what God can do. Luke 6.38, Jesus says, Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It's like a, a big wine press. Just stuff it full. He goes, you've got to just push it. He goes, it's going to run over. We pour it into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. This applies to money. It applies to friendships. It applies to love. If you want friends, kids, if you want friends, if you want to have so many friends, you're going to have to beat them off. It's just be friendly. Be nice. Be friendly, be kind, be loving towards people without expecting anything in return. If you do it, to say, I'll be kind to you if you can be my bosom buddy. No, no, no. Then, then you become a leech and you, you want that person for yourself. But if you're friendly and friendly and friendly towards people, you're going to find it's going to come back to you in friendships. If you're kind to people, it's going to come back to you. Husbands, if you're kind to your wife, if you're courteous, buy her flowers at least once a year. <laughs> Do the dishes at least once a month. Try doing your own washing. What are you going to do? If you don't take each other for granted, if you are kind and courteous and think of the other person, what's going to happen? It's going to return back to you. So Jesus says, give. Whether it's money, love, kindness, friendliness, consideration, and it will be given to you. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And today, we have the opportunity to sow into developing these facilities more. And as for those of you who are visiting with us today, you're our guests and you're thinking, well, we do this once a year. We don't do it every service. And we produce this, hear the vision, see the vision. Hear the sound, see the vision. And we've been preparing ourselves for the last month or so in relation to giving today. And we are going to give, kids. We're going to put this in. And if you, haven't come, if you haven't actually come with your card, we have got some there for you. And the ushers, if you know what you're going to give, if you've prayed and reflected and you want to do it and you've forgotten, then the ushers will bring you a pen. So just lift your hand up and they will do it. And there's one of these next to you. Most of you have already prepared this. But if you need a, if you need a pen and you need to fill this in, please do it. If you're one of our guests here today, this is not for you. This is for those of us who say this is our home and we've thought and prayed and reflected. And when I shared this first week of June, you notice what I didn't do. I didn't say, okay, spend an hour on this and then say, now give. See, I don't respond to that. That's emotional pressure. That's kind of like uh, not giving me a chance to think and pray and reflect. And so even if you did come to me and say, I, I want to put this in, I would say, no, no, you just go and think and pray and reflect. And we don't want people giving out of emotionalism. We don't want people giving out of pressure. We want people to give out of prayer and dependence on Jesus and the leading of the Holy Spirit you do your sums, you work out, you've got to pay your taxes. You don't, don't rob Peter to pay Paul. If some of you are saying, I will give, I will give, but I won't give my tithe. I say, don't give to that. Your tithe belong to God on a weekly basis. Oh, I'll give to mission. I won't give to missions monthly. I'll give to this. No, don't give to this then. We want you to give to missions. If anything, in our missions giving, which is about 130, 40,000 a year, we want to see that increase to 200,000 plus because of the, the need for these poor countries where our denominational family is. So, so we've had three or four weeks to reflect on it. And uh, 
So we're going to give today. Let me share with you. We have said if just over 200 couples or individuals give according to the schedule that we put in here, we've actually broken it down, we can achieve the goal of raising $340,000 for the new electrical lighting system, the new uh, PA system, um, speakers and amplifiers, the new screens and, and the things that we need that we should have done three or four years ago, but we had to do the air conditioning. We can easily accomplish it. Let me share with you 38 couples already. 38 couples and individuals have already pledged $170,000. That's great. That's fantastic. They've already emailed, let us know, and some of them are putting it in here today. And, uh, and so we're taking up a support offering, and I have suggested maybe even a quarter or a third you put in. Like Kath and I are putting in 5,000 bucks today. That's a quarter. Our commitment is $20,000 over the next three years. And we can do that because we can afford to do it. Uh, she earns three times as much as me. I've got her out there working so that we can give more and more to God. No, no. But really, because of Kath's generosity, I wanted it to be 15 again. I thought, hey, 15 like we did last year. She said, let's make it 20. And so whom God has given much to, we say, you know what? He's blessed us. We want to give. Some of you can give that. You can give more than that. Most of you won't be able to. It's not the amount that you give. That little boy had almost nothing. If you look at the schedule of what we've said here, if you just forego a cappuccino, if you have three cappuccinos a day, or let's say two, you forego one, that's $450 a day, seven days a week, that's nearly 30 bucks. 30 bucks a week, you work that out over three years, how much you can put in. So anyone and everyone can contribute. And you know what? It's not the amount. Some of you who give, who'll be giving much smaller amounts, sacrificially, you're probably giving more than what Kath and I are giving. So it's not the, the numbers. Those of you that are blessed financially, you've got two jobs, uh, you've got significant assets and wealth, I encourage you to give as much as you can. But I found that our pensioners and our kids and others end up giving enormously. So we're really thrilled that we can do this. And let's build on the 38 couples and individuals who have pledged $170,000. If all of us can be involved, we should be able to accomplish the goal of $340,000 for this. And we want to include uh, around $44,000, $48,000 of debt reduction. We felt we wanted to do that. We've let you know about this several months ago which means another hunt for three years, another 144,000 or so. So we're trying to be responsible, reduce our indebtedness, and uh, which is not massive, but it's, it's enough to say, you know what? We don't want to pay the bank the money. We'd sooner give it to Jesus. So are we ready? Are we ready? Let me lead you in prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to give like that little boy gave. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you speak directly to us through your precious Holy Spirit, your spirit that lives within us, and you guide us through your word. And we thank you that we've been able to pray and reflect and not be pressured or, or, or somehow feel like we have to. But Lord, we choose to give because we want to, out of love for you, out of support for your church, and not to limit what we give in our weekly tithes and our monthly missions giving. And Lord, I do pray that as every person here, young and old, makes a commitment, let them know, Lord, not just that you love them, but that you're going to support them and bless them and help them in so many ways. We give not to get... We give because of love, but we know, Lord, you're no man's debtor. And that somehow you return and you bless as you've blessed Kathy and I in ways that are just unbelievable to us. But we accept it. And you give, you bless, not to make us selfish and greedy, but to be able to give even more and to sow more into your kingdom, into your work, to missions and other areas. So, Lord, I pray, let there be great blessing upon your people let there be great joy that comes through this act of giving well your word says 
It's more blessed to give than to receive. And we thank you. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for this opportunity. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Now, you may be seated. Giving Jesus our best is not an option. I think it's a responsibility. And uh, I try and base my life on that. If, um, if I'm giving a message, whether it's to a small group or to a large group, I try and give my best. And uh, so when I read a Bible story, I'd like to read all the stories in relation to one miracle, to think and pray. And uh, I don't come up here half-baked to think, I'll just give them my seconds, I'll just give them my leftovers. But I try and give you my best, as if it could be my last message I ever speak to you. And to do it with all the energy and passion that God has given to me. And uh, I believe in this, giving God our best. The story of that little boy, I wanted to share with the little kids to encourage them, but I want to just relate it to ourselves now. You know what the greatest thing you can give to God is? It's your heart. It's not your money, actually. It's not anything or some ministry. I'm going to do God a favor by serving him. Um, the greatest thing you can give to the Lord is your heart. And uh, God's love can be explained and defined in the word giving. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And uh, it's not a feeling. It's a decision to, to give and to give our best. He gave his one and only son. He gave us his best. He looked amongst heaven and he found the finest. And God the Father sent Jesus as a gift to the earth. And God knows what sowing one's best is all about. He knows about giving ever since time began. I mean, he gave us this amazing and beautiful and resource-laden earth. And sadly, how humans are wrecking it and uh, not looking after it and abusing it. And thankfully, there's a turning around where people are becoming conscious of looking after this, this planet that God has given to us. He gave us self-consciousness. We're not machines. We're not robots. We have freedom and dignity. Even though we chose in our freedom to separate ourselves from him and to turn our backs from him and do our own thing, thinking that we're going to be like, we're going to be little gods in our own right, and we've consigned ourselves to hell on earth and eternal hell by deliberately choosing to turn our backs upon a loving creator that doesn't force love, but he wants love to be voluntary because he chose to love us and he wants us to love him in return. But God didn't say, well, they're terrible, I hate them. He says, I hate what they do, but I love them, they're my creation. And he found a way, his love found a way by which his own sense of justice could be appeased. Someone had to pay the price. Someone had to pay the, the penalty for the sins that have been committed. And you know what? He himself paid that penalty by sending his son. So his, his love found a way by which he could appease his justice. And there on the cross when Jesus was hanging there, God the Father had to turn his back as he was condemned for the sins of the world. Because God cannot look upon sin. And in that brief moment, I don't understand it. I, I, I can't. I've been trying to think it through for 48 years. I don't understand it, but I accept it. That somehow, all your sins, my sins, every sin in the past was placed on Jesus. As his blood was shed, atonement was made. The justice of God was appeased. And now, as Christ is buried and as he rises again, free from what put him there, our sins are in the grave. And, and he rose, went to heaven, sent the Holy Spirit. So now he looks at us and accepts us free from sin, free from the guilt of sin. The penalty of sin has been paid by Jesus. Past tense is done. You will not be judged on your past sins. The power of sin can be broken in this present life. 
through the Holy Spirit. So it's not just that the penalty of sin has been dealt with, passed, but he, he went back to heaven, sent the Holy Spirit to come and live within us so the power of sin can be broken, that we can learn to live as he wants us to live. Not with all the past addictions and problems and, 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 and shadows that gradually we can be free of those things. And one day we're going to be actually free from the very presence of sin. Penalty past, power of sin broken now and the presence of sin will be removed one day when we go to heaven or when Christ returns. And in heaven there's no more tears, no more suffering, no more pain. And uh, I was just talking to one of our beautiful ladies, uh, um, or Don Luca's wife, and, and uh, his son was here. And they, you know, he was buried last week, and we just talked, and, and you know, lots of tears. And I said, don't worry about, don't be embarrassed crying in front of me. I said, I cried like a baby when my mother died suddenly, you know, all those years ago, three months I was grieving. There's nothing wrong with grief. I said, but there's blessing in grieving. There's, there's you know, you'll be comforted. I said, you it's important. I said, but you know where he is, don't you? Because, oh, we know. I said, how would you be if you did not know where he was going, if you had no faith? If you thought, that's it, kaput, finished. I'll never see him again. You will see him again. And uh, this is the hope that we have. It's an eternal hope. As surely as Jesus rose from the dead, we will rise in him. There will be a resurrection of the dead. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. And that fills me with great hope and confidence. I'm going to see my parents who, who loved Jesus and gave their lives to him. And I don't grieve as someone who is, doesn't have hope. And so this is, God has given us his very best, guys. And um, look at Romans 5. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, you were helpless. You were hopeless. Not hopeless, but hopeless. You had no hope. You, you couldn't do anything about your condition. You see, just at the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. He didn't say, well, you become godly first. I'll wait till you repent and, and, turn, and turn, 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 turn the other, you know, turn over the leaf, you know, just, just become a better person, then I'll save you. No, he says, in your ungodly state, even when we were sinners, even when we were rebels against him, and we were hurting each other and hurting ourselves, Christ died for us. Wow, that I don't understand. That manner of love. Because we love those who love us. We don't love those who hate us. We don't love those who, 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 who say terrible things about us. This is where Christ actually said, now, with how I've loved you and with my power living in you, you can turn the other cheek. You can love the unlovely. You can love your enemies. You can pray for those who, who persecute you. So, so what a scripture. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus is God's greatest gift to this earth. And all that God is asking of human beings in return is their hearts. Hearts of love, hearts of worship, our desires. You know, and some people withdraw their hearts from God for varying reasons. And it breaks my heart to see it when I've seen people who have come to Christ and have endeavouring to live the Christian life and then gradually they just fall away and become indifferent to God and harden their hearts. And it's just, it's terrible to see that. And I think, I don't understand how that can happen. And uh, if you're on the, the journey where maybe you're withdrawing your heart a little bit from him, please don't harden your heart. Don't give it to somebody else who's less worthy. Don't give it to something else that is not of the same value. Give your hearts back to God again. And more than that, as a church and as a community, the Christian Family Centre, my prayer is that God would enlarge our hearts as a church community. We haven't arrived yet. We're not coasting. This is my 41st year here leading the church. I feel like we're just getting started. 
I feel like the best is yet to come. Like we, we, we're not, you know, we have a, a vision, we have a faith challenge before us. Why the heck did we buy this property in Alice Springs? $550,000, why? We made that decision without actually lining up all the sums. We just thought, you know what, let's do it. And on Wednesday night when I went there, we had 20 of the key movers and shakers. And I spoke with them and because Pastor Ben and Pastor Reb, they've never led a stewardship campaign before. I'm an old war horse at this. And I said, just follow me. I said, just, just listen to what I do. And at the end, everyone's going, yeah, let's do it. And I said, Ben, now it's over to you. The next three months, you lead it. You can do it. But all the people, some of them were dear old people. And, and our indigenous leader, Malcolm, you know, some of, the, some of us were going, oh, yeah, well, look, it's the white fellows, the, non, the, non, the Europeans, the, sorry, the non-indigenous people, you know, Indians, Chinese, white fellows, they'll give. The indigenous people won't give. That's what's our thinking. And Malcolm was in the meeting, and in his own quiet way, he goes, goes, what about the indigenous people? Aboriginal people love to give. He just made a couple of comments, and, and uh, he said, well, and, and we said, well, Malcolm, yeah, how? He goes, well, we just... Direct debit. <laughs> That's what happened to me. And the sad thing is this, and it's a terrible sin that is committed against beautiful indigenous people. They want to give. Malcolm said they want to give. Because but every fortnight, their families come, and if they don't give them their money, they beat them up. Some members who are into grog, violence, drugs, and they come and persecute these people. It's terrible. And the authorities can do very little. Even Malcolm himself has that happening. Oh, it's payday. Yes. He works a responsible job in, in the hospital sector as an interpreter. And he said, the only way I could overcome it is I, I did it electronically. He tithes 10%. He, he goes, they can give. I was OK, how do we do it? He goes, we'll take them there. We'll show them how to do it. And then we figured out if 100 Indigenous people Give $10 a week. That's $1,000 a week. The mortgage is $2,700 a month. That means over a third they can cover themselves. So straight away, you see, what are these among so many? I wasn't even thinking of the little boys. Almost nothing. And we said, even if those indigenous people give $5 a week, that's 500 bucks a week. That's an enormous amount. 500 a week over... Over four weeks, that's five. That's two thousand, isn't it? Is that right? That's five hundred. Hundred? No, it's not. It's two thousand a month. If it's five hundred a week, it's just two thousand a month. That's right. Hey, my son, I'm not very good at maths. History's my subject. So therefore, two thirds, two thirds can be covered by five dollars a week by a hundred people. Hey, so Malcolm blew us away. They want to give. And so there we are. I, I just, I, I was, so, so we're doing that. We stepped out. Why, why did we plant CFC South? 35, 40 of our best people. Best givers. Best ministers. Best preachers. Ah, oh, we gave our best. Why? Because we don't give our second best. We don't give our leftovers. We train pastors and leaders to go. And that group of 35 to 40 people, Tim is telling me now, he hasn't got the figures, but we think it's about 150 men, women and children already. Less than a year. And half of them are kids. I never expected that. And we give 7% of our income to church planting. We give 3% into our denominational family, which is church planting and mission. So we give 10%. So we give our best. So we want to reach more people for Christ. I mean, take Friday night with the kids. I mean, with what Alan and Jill and others are doing, the Friday night kids club. Kids are getting saved. There's a whole stack of children coming, and who knows, that could go to 50, 60, 100 kids that come along. I'm going to reach more people for Christ. I've had two young kids who are now in their mid-30s who have come back to the church, or one lady last week at the 8.30 service, her parents wouldn't let her come to church, but she made a decision in the school and was coming to the, to the club that we set up in the school. And now she's a married woman with kids. She goes to a church in Melbourne. She came back last... Sunday, she goes, do you know me? I said, no, I don't know you. She goes, I'm so-and-so. She goes, I know you. Because when I turned out, I could come here. I thought, man, 
I didn't even know she existed. But she was known by Jesus and by people in the church, and she's going on with God. Another one of our young men that, that is bringing his kids along here, who used to come to our kids' club. Beautiful young man that I met. And I thought, oh, yeah, I've seen that face before. And, uh, and so you just... So how do we know? So we've got to reach more children for Christ. We've got to reach... That's why we want this, this camp that's going to be here. Bring along non-Christian kids. They'll get saved. Let's have a revival. Let's get them all filled with the Holy Spirit and power. And, uh, and, and we want to see the families of these kids that are coming in on Friday night come to Christ as well. So we've got to reach more people for Christ. We've got to plant more churches. And... Uh, We've got to expand our missions giving from, you know, uh, that we're doing. So, so, guys, as we enlarge our hearts, what happens is, is there's a greater dimension of faith and giving and generosity that's there. And God will somehow expand your capacity even to give more. That's what's happened to Kathy and myself. I said to you many times, we came back from our honeymoon with $28 to our name or 24 whatever it was. I can't believe how God has blessed us. Amazingly. But he's blessed us so that we become a blessing to, to many people. So when you give your life to Christ, the prosperity and the favour of God comes upon you. The feeding of the 5,000, the story, illustrates that we're able to do far more with our life when we give it over to Jesus. And this blessing, because one little boy decided to sow his almost nothing, Amazing story. And I, I don't know how you view the story, but when you read Matthew and Mark's account, it's like Jesus says, well, you, you feed them. And they're probably going, what? With what? Nothing. Then they've got this little fish, and what he does, he, he blesses it, gives thanks to God. I just see Jesus there saying, I think he's thinking, this is going to freak those boys out. And he's given thanks, and he breaks it up, and he hands it to them, the twelve. So Peter's got half a tail of a, of a fish and a little bit of bread. Andrew's got, he's gone, go and do it. So after Jesus prayed and blessed the almost nothing, I don't think all of a sudden it became ten snappers. Oh, or, or 15 loaves of bread, each of them were carrying it to the, I don't think that happened at all. I think as they took their almost nothing in their basket and as they went down, down, down and here's Peter and he's hungry not Peter the, 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 the disciple I think as Peter or Andrew has is, is got this thing they've got, to, they've got to trust the Lord his word, he says you feed them they've got to believe in the efficacy of his prayer and he believed. And so, so they've got to, so as they're stepping out, do you think all of a sudden, shh, become a snapper? Or a loaf of bread? I think he gave it to this big guy. You take it. A bit more than that. It's, 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 it's like, and I think Peter must have gone, what just happened? Did you take it? Yeah, you took it, but it seems like it's still there. He didn't take much. This big burly man here. Just take her. <laughs> and I think what's happening, as they're stepping out, I think they're going, what the heck? It's, it's still there. And maybe it didn't, I don't think it became, and I just think then they started running. Quick, before it runs out. I reckon they went quickly and 5,000 people were fed. In the act of obedience... In the act of trust, nothing happens in God's kingdom unless we obey his commands. Nothing happens in God's kingdom unless we trust his promises. Faith, the coin of faith has a head and a tail. One is the commands of God. We're addressed to our will, where we are challenged to obey him even when we don't want to obey him. And then the other side is where we trust the promises when all hell is breaking loose. Sickness suddenly comes upon you. A disaster suddenly comes. A marriage crisis. A job situation. And, and you've got promises. And all your feelings are telling you the opposite. But he says, trust my word. This is what my word says. Faith, genuine faith, has the element of obedience addressed to our will and, and, and trust addressed to our believing capacities. 
And I think those guys demonstrated faith. They had to step out. And, and amazingly, it worked. 5,000 men were filled. And then there was so much food. Somehow it multiplied that Jesus says, gather, gather up the baskets, get some baskets, and they filled 12 baskets full. And, you know, the real spiritual dudes, commentators go, yes, one for each of the disciples. Nah, I don't think so. Do you know who the real hero was? The little boy who gave his almost nothing. He could have stopped the process. He could have stopped the miracle by saying no. But he somehow believed. He must have heard something. Of what he must have heard something, and the little kid believed, and, and he sowed his almost nothing. I, I just got, I can't prove it from scripture, but I just can't see Jesus giving it to the 12. I think he gave it to the little boy and stuck it on his handlebars and said, Okay, go now home. And I think that kid, as he was pedaling home or on his chariot or whatever, he would have come and said, Mom, 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 you won't believe what happened to me today. I met Jesus and I gave him my almost nothing. And look what we've got back for the next couple of weeks. Fish and bread. Quickly, put it in the freezer. Let's get ready. <laughs> That's how I see it. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 10. 6 and 10 says this. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Now he who supplies seed to the sower, you're the sower, and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. If for some reason you, you, you couldn't give today for whatever reason, or maybe you haven't thought it through, it's not too late. Don't miss out this opportunity. Let's see if we can accomplish this goal that we've set. Make a decision today. Don't put it off. One day, that one day will never happen. Make a decision. And see if God won't return blessing to you. Or maybe through this series you're saying, you know what, I need to start tithing regularly, electronically. Embrace the greed reduction strategy that Adrian has talked about. Once you allow your life to become a channel for the blessing of God, once you allow your heart to open up to God and you give permission for God to come in and become a channel through whom he can move, you will find his blessing and prosperity. Jesus said this. It is more of a blessing to give than to receive. On my desk, if you ever get a chance to look at the stuff I have on my desk, I've got photos of the kids and grandkids and all that stuff. There's a little plaque. It's a dodgy looking thing now. It's about 25 years old. And I've got it put up there, and it says this. I wish I could put it up there, but I, it says this. Faith giving. Faith, not fake giving, faith giving. And when I read this 25, 30 years ago, I said, I want to make this up, stick it on my desk. I don't want to forget this. Is money that God gives through you that he would not give to you if you were not going to pass it on? I've proven that. I cannot believe how much money God has given through Kathy and myself that I don't think he would have given it to us if we weren't prepared to pass it on and to give it away. Wow. I think it's a great st I think that fits in with that scripture, 2 Corinthians. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply, increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. So we want to become a channel for God to flow through us, our hearts to be enlarged. And the blessing of God is upon us not to channel it into our own lives and become more selfish and greedy, but to channel it out to others in need. Freely you've received, freely you can give. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this amazing story of just a little boy but it so captured the New Testament writers they recorded four times. Thank you what we see there, the principles of faith, obedience, trust, the sovereignty of Jesus, his miracle working power, 
And Lord, thank you that the story helps us to understand faith and to trust in a saviour that can increase and enlarge our capacity to love and to give and to serve. And so, Lord, I do pray for everyone here today that they would give their best to you in response to you giving us your best. And we give you our best, Lord. Our best is our heart, our worship. And we don't do it to earn anything or to receive anything, but out of gratitude. We thank you. We praise you. And we know you return so much to us. You've blessed our lives so much. I pray help people, Lord, to understand this and to embrace this, this amazing principle of giving you our very best, just like that little boy who gave his almost nothing. But it was his best at that time and how you multiplied it and blessed thousands of people. What a lesson for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand together as we sing this.